I, I want to dedicate um, this sermon or teaching, it's really a little bit more of a text study than a sermon, I, I hope, um, to our beloved Hannah Mintz. Hannah, um, as many of you know, who for many, many years, I think since uh, the very beginning of Ikar, has been um, a beloved community member um, and, and an incredible volunteer, a deep friend uh, to many of us and, and a teacher for all of us. Um, Hannah died last night um, just as we were getting ready to begin Shabbat services here. And I felt um, when I got the, the text from, from Marina and Chad, Hannah's daughter and son-in-law, I felt this, um, this echo of RBG's death, um, which also happened when I was standing in the same spot in my home just as I was leaving to go uh, to come here for, for Rosh Hashanah services. And I felt the weight of needing to tell the community that another extraordinary woman who had defied all odds um, had, had left this world and was transitioning to the next just as holy time was descending upon us. Um, not as many people in this world know Hannah Mintz's name as knew RBG, um, but those who did knew uh, that she was the embodiment of love and goodness and I uh, know that the impact of her life will continue to reverberate in this world for many, many years to come. Um, and she has surely touched many people, even those who, um, who never got to meet her in person. And so I really pray that her memory is a blessing. And you'll see why I wanted to lift her up, particularly in connection to these um, thoughts, which I, which I put together before she died, but just after my last visit to her yesterday afternoon as I was um, holding the space with Hannah, with Rose Mazur, who also is in final moments now leaving this world and contemplating Rosh Chodesh Elul and what it means to come to this marker in time that always holds with it the possibility of personal transformation and redemption and also the incredible grief and sadness at the loss of our beloved Giddy Silverstein, and knowing that that time was all coming together in one sacred moment this year. So I will share with you that um, our medical task force, which I mentioned earlier, um, met at length this week. And we met to try to understand the implications of all of these variants um, that are now upon us and to contemplate what options we have for meaningful gathering for the High Holy Days. And I really feel the weight of recognizing just how much is at stake this year, understanding that after everything that we've been through for the last year and a half, really people's sense of connectedness to this world is at stake, as many people are reporting um, that they're now feeling increasingly frustrated anxious, disappointed, uncertain, and increasingly untethered from friends, from community, from the world. There's a sense that we can survive anything if it's just a short period and we know we'll come out on the other side. But now an overwhelming and prevailing sense of worry, how much of this can we take? How much of this can we take? And I remember seeing many months ago that someone wise wrote, that anyone who comes out of this last year and a half unscathed has simply not been paying attention. Or maybe what he wrote was, anyone who comes out of this last year and a half unscathed is spiritually dead. I can't remember exactly. Um, and yet now it's not even over. And now, in addition to everything else, we also have to struggle to make sense of the fact that now, at least here in the United States, it really feels like this is a pandemic by choice that we could have avoided much of this latest wave of terror and illness and death had there not been a war fought in our country over the truth. With truly nefarious, nearly all vaxxed people profiting off of that war on the truth and throwing all of our lives into mayhem once again. So, I really dreamt that we were going to be together, 3,600 people packed into this building, 
or at least a thousand if we uh, respected the guidelines, um, praying and singing and dancing and hugging. And we were very, very close to that becoming a reality as we would all celebrate moving into this next chapter together that the, the teary dark night had indeed given way to a new joyous dawn. And yet we all know that we're, we're not there yet. And it is confounding and it is frustrating and it is disorienting. And I find myself drawn this week to one of the core messages of Parshat Re'e, which we have, I think many of us spent many hours looking at and trying to parse out over the years. And I wanna look at again together today and I actually um, have some copies, not nearly enough for everybody, so we're really gonna have to share. And it's okay if you don't have one, I just thought you might like to look, thank you. So what one of the core messages of this Parsha is, is very simply that there is a dream and there is reality. And what matters most in life is how we navigate the world between the dream and the reality, how we navigate the space between what is and what ought to be. So there's a very famous progression of verses that you'll find on these sheets in Deuteronomy chapter 15. It begins with this most audacious, most astonishing claim that appears in chapter 15, verse four. Ephes ki lo yevcha evyon, there will be no poor among you, says God, when we enter into this new land. There will be no poor among you. And then if you skip down only six or seven verses, you come to chapter 15, verse 11, which says, Ki lo, ki lo evyon. There will never cease to be needy ones in your land. So I just want to ask you to hold for a moment. Don't get lost in the sheets. You can take them home. It's really just for your reference. But I want to ask you to think about what it means that our most sacred text says to us, when you cross over this land, you band of slaves who have suffered under hundreds of years of oppression are now walking toward a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And when you get there, your reality will be one in which there are simply no poor. There is no poverty. That struggle will be gone, eradicated from this land and from this people. Imagine that dream being planted for a people that had suffered so much. And then only a couple of verses later to hear there will never cease to be needy in this land. There will always be struggle. There will always be impoverished. There will always be those who are yearning, those who hunger, those who are desperate for more. How do we even understand a text that can share with us two totally contradictory verses in such a short space? We know there are contradictions between big ideas in the text, but this is a promise. And then the promise is immediately undermined. The Torah is awakening us to an unavoidable reality. There will be a gap between the ideal and the real. And yet they are both true. There is truth to the ideal and there is truth to the real. And that is true in our world and it's true in our families and it's true in our work and it's true in our Torah. And, and Torah is demanding of us that we reckon with this reality. What we do when things in the real world do not match our dreams is simply the most important question that we will have to contend with in the course of our lives. This is an incredibly painful reality. It's also an essential truth that in some ways the meaning of life is waking up to the chasm between the world of our greatest aspirations, a world of justice and order and love and safety and security and fairness and human dignity and, and the world of our reality, which is a world of chaos and pandemic and inexplicable accidents that turn your life upside down in a heartbeat, a world of injustice, a world of randomness, a world of cancer, a world of loss. And the question for us 
is what do we do in the space between Deuteronomy 5 and Deuteronomy 11, in the space between our dreams and our reality? When the circumstances are not what we want and need them to be, how are we to live? And this is why I want to draw our attention today to one of the verses that appears in between these two, these two spaces. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7, which says the following. If, however, there is a needy person among you, one of your kinsmen in any of your settlements in the land that God will give you, do not harden your heart, do not shut your hand against the one who is needy. Rather, open your hand and lend the person whatever it is that that person needs. In other words, don't you blind yourself to the reality because you're living in the fantasy that things are okay when things are not at all okay. And don't succumb to the turmoil and the confusion. Don't give up hope because things are as bad as they are. Instead, we have to find a way to not be paralyzed by the reality that we live in a space that is not at all what we wanted. And instead, we are called to get to work and to do something, to try to bridge the gap between that dream and that reality. And Rashi says that there are people who painfully deliberate on whether or not they should actually step into that fray. And that's why the Torah needs to say, don't close your heart. Do not harden your heart. And then there are people whose hearts are open and they want to be in the fray and they want to do the right thing and they want to show up, but they close their hands because when the moment actually comes, they're scared or they feel too vulnerable or they don't think they're going to be able to find the right words. They're, they're worried maybe for their own safety, for their own family. And that's why Rashi says it has to say both. Don't harden your heart and don't shut your hand because it's not enough to cultivate a heart that is soft and tender in the face of impossible circumstances. We have to find a way to match those right intentions and good heartedness with right actions to actually make sure that we step in and engage. You know, there, there's so much to say. There's so much to say about what it means to live in that painful space between the real and the ideal. To acknowledge with every waking moment that we actually cannot control the world. We can't even control our own lives. There's so little control that we actually have. I think being thrust back into COVID, after we did everything right, after we distanced and we masked and we vaxxed, and now we're masking again and distancing again, after all of that to be thrown back into this, it shows us that, that, that we, we can't control the world around us, but we can live in this space responsibly. We can keep feeling and we can keep acting right. And I started this by talking about the pandemic and, and the ways that it's turned all of us upside down and inside out. But of course, this is also about Hannah. And of course, this is also about Giddy. And I just want to say a word to, to Jesse and Amit and to Ziv and Oren as we, as we prepare to step into this month of incredible sadness and reflection and love. I want to say to you what I said to you, is it five years? So Giddy died just before his fifth birthday, which means as much time since then is as much time as he was in this world and his, and his presence echoes every single day because of you and because of the way that you have asked us, demanded of us that we live in the space in between the real and the ideal with you. And I remember that I said to you when he left this world, that every single one of us would give anything we had in order to try to take your pain away. But we know that we can't, and the only thing that we can do is live with you in that 
in that terrible gray space, in that darkness, and, and cry with you and sing with you and remind you every day of all the love. And not just feel it, but actually engage it. Not just put our hearts in the right place, but, but actually do what you asked us to do to hold his memory, which is to act, engage in acts of real kindness and love in the world, as small as they might be in the individual. Because you understood then something absolutely extraordinary about this world, that, that these small actions that are matched with big hearts end up having some kind of transformative impact on the world. And because of that wisdom, Giddy is so present in my life and in our lives and in the lives of our community and in the lives of people all around the world. And that's because you knew and you understood and I will continue to make it that way as long as I live and I know that I'm not alone here in this space. And that's exactly what Hannah Mintz did too. And there is gonna be a lot of time in the days ahead to talk about this incredible human this incredible human who stepped into the fray in between the world as it is and the world as it could be, and who made space in her home, in her heart, and in our community for the impossible to become possible. And she didn't do it once, and she didn't do it because she won awards for it. She just did it because it was right. It's, it's exactly in these moments of loss and uncertainty when the gap is greatest between what is and what really should be in the world, that we're called to find our way to each other with love and not just to feel for each other, but to do something about it. Because we can't actually take each other's pain away and we can't make magic happen, but we can show up. And I am afraid that we are entering into another period of time and hopefully it's a short one in which once again our worlds are gonna get smaller and smaller and the things that we let ourselves do out there in the world will shrink again. And it's my strongest and most sincere prayer for us that even as our worlds go strong, grow smaller, our hearts are enlarged, that we grow bigger from this. And then if I might be audacious enough to ask for it, that we match that big heartedness with big action because the world is not gonna survive on our love if we don't transform that love into work. And the Zilbersteins and Hannah are just two of the people, two of the families in this world that have shown us that that's possible. And I hope in some way we can help bring comfort to those who live forever in the gray space by doing everything in our power in this month of Elul and in all the days forward to live with the biggest hearts and the biggest and boldest and best right, righteous and just actions that we can and that we do so every single day until we actually are able to reach the world that we dream of. We hold that dream because the dream is real and yet we know every single day that we're not there yet and we're committed to walking together until we get there. May Hannah's memory always be a blessing for all of us. May we always remember Giddy's name and his heart and his sparkles and his beauty. Zichron Libracham.